Uh, Ani Ruchivarman is a fifth-year PhD student at MIT in the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. He worked with Hari Balakrishnan. Uh, in 2014, he shared uh, an Applied Networking Research Prize from the Internet Engineering Task Force. He previously completed his master's at MIT in 2012 and his BTEC from IIT Madras in 2010. His research is in the area of computer networks, and his research interests include congestion control, network emulation, and network measurement. Anirudh. Thanks, Keith. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, I want to keep this interactive, so feel free to interrupt me at any point of questions. <coughs> so um, this talk, if you think about the holy grail of congestion control today, it's this um, hypothetical algorithm that works across, like say, a wide range of topologies, uh, a wide range of link rates, uh, propagation delays, workloads, any other axes that you can think of. Um, and that's sort of what the designer would have in mind when like, sort of designing this protocol. But in practice, what we see is TCP has well-known failure modes. Um, so when, when TCP runs on uh, wireless links, uh, the wireless losses are confused for congestion related losses and uh, TCP backs off all too quickly, uh, leading to degraded throughput. Uh, so this was a problem in 95. Now about 20 years later, the problems kind of reached a different extreme. Like the cellular wireless links don't ever drop a packet. So this causes other issues now because TCP congestion control never backs off and it leads to huge standing queues, not just for itself, but for something else. I mean, I could go on with more examples, but the model of the story here is that despite the designer's best intentions, these protocols that we've come up with in the past seem to latch on to certain assumptions about the network conditions that they should be operating on and so on. So given that this seems to be recurring again and again, um, <clears throat> it seems worthwhile to pause and ask this question, which is largely the focus of this talk, um, which is, can we rigorously quantify how easy is it to learn a network protocol uh, to achieve a specific goal, knowing fully well that the designer will start off with a mismatched set of assumptions. And by mismatched, I mean that the assumptions that the designer has in her head at the time of designing the protocol will necessarily differ in some way from the conditions that are encountered in practice. So I use the term learn here in a somewhat specific sense. Um, based on the definition of learning from Valiant's paper in 1984 to mean knowledge acquisition without explicit programming. The explicit programming here sort of means that we want to restrict the amount of manual input that goes into this procedure, this learning procedure, and we want to automate it as far as possible. So, so that we don't constrain the network protocol by our preconceived notions of how, how the protocol should look. So that's going to be the talk at a high level. For, for, for the entire talk, this will be the experimental method that I follow. So we first write down the topology of a network. This is just a mock-up. I mean, we all know this. And like we then annotate it with the link rates and the propagation delays on various links. We then specify which um, we specify the senders in blue and the receivers in green. And then we add a model of the application workload which is some rectangular wave pattern here, which represents when the application is on and has traffic to offer, and when the application is dormant and doesn't have anything to set. So you can imagine this being some kind of a model for like a video conference where there are periods in which there's data being sent and the periods in which the uh, video conference is basically idle. So that's one network. Uh, we have several such network configurations, uh, network plus workload configurations. And together, we call all of these the set of training networks. And we feed this as input to a learner uh, along with an objective function. Um, so the objective functions could be anything that you wish the protocol does on the network. So what, what's the goal of the protocol? That's sort of what we try and capture quantitatively with the objective function. Uh, these could be things like throughput, um, like the number of bits per second, uh, the per packet delay. Uh, you could incorporate notions of fairness uh, by using like a log term over throughput. So when you try and maximize the sum of the log throughputs, I mean, given some constraints, you're maximizing, I mean, you're trying to achieve proportionally fair throughput allocations. 
so you can roll in uh, things like fairness into the objective function. You can also minimize things like average flow completion time. So the objective function sort of guides the learner in picking better protocols, and it's our proxy for what the protocol should do on, on a real network. So then the learner, uh, as a result of the learning process, it spits out a condition control algorithm. And for the purposes of this talk, to make this concrete, we use a specific learner, which is the Remy Protocol Synthesis Tool, which is published in SIGCOP 2013. And we call the learned congestion control algorithms the Remy CCs. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm not going to focus on exactly how this process itself works. In other words, how the Remy CCs are generated based on the objective function of the training networks. Um, I'm happy to answer any of those questions offline. But really, our interest here is to see what happens when these condition control algorithms are run on a different set of testing networks. So by carefully controlling the differences between the set of training networks and the set of testing networks, uh, we can simulate this different kinds of mismatched assumptions. So that will be the experimental method for the entire talk. So this is all well and good, but it's probably worthwhile to sanity check whether this approach even works. Like, what, what good is it to use a somewhat ad hoc protocol generation tool in generating a set of condition control algorithms? Does this give us? condition control algorithms that are any good on the objective functions that they were designed for. So the sanity check, we sort of take this degenerate scenario where instead of a set of training networks, we have exactly one training network, which is the simplest network you can think of, which is just two nodes connected by a single link. There are two send, I mean, there are two applications running on the sender node, and the receiver node simply acts all packets. Um, and the metric that we're interested in optimizing is the sum of the log throughput over delay across both senders. So simple, uh, dumbbell network, two nodes, and some log throughput over delay. So that's the training network. It's just one of those. So there's no uncertainty in terms of a range of networks that you want to optimize for. It's exactly one, which is the same as the testing network. So we also assume there's no mismatch. In machine learning parlance, this is sort of like learning on a set of training data and then testing on the same data. So you would expect that you get somewhat reasonable results here. So to summarize our results from this experiment, we plot queuing delay on the y-axis, which is a flipped y-axis. So lower queuing delays are to the right, and higher throughputs uh, are to the top. So up and to the right is better. So on this graph, we first plot uh, the throughput and queuing delay achieved by an ideal protocol. So let me just explain what that means. <coughs> Sorry. So an ideal protocol is this hypothetical protocol where a central controller sort of knows every time a sender turns on or off um, all the senders that are on at any given instant. And as soon as the sender turns on, it recomputes the proportionally fair throughput allocations and assigns each sender its current proportionally fair rate. So that's the ideal protocol. Um, and we also assume all this happens instantaneously. So at any instant, it does assigns its current proportionally fair uh, throughput. And because all senders are sending exactly at that rate, there's no queuing delay. So this is a hypothetical protocol. It's not clear that this can be achieved in practice, but it serves as a good upper bound. Um, so related to this, where does the Remy CC pass? So at least on this graph, it's pretty close. And, and on this specific experiment, um, the Remy CC was about 5% of the throughput of the ideal protocol and was about 10% higher than the ideal protocol in terms of the end-to-end -end, um, delay measurements. So this at least gives us some sanity check that on simplified scenarios, uh, the protocol generation tool is doing a sensible job. Now, just for comparison, here's where two commonly used algorithms today lie. So this is uh, the cubic as implemented in, within NH2, um, which is the default condition control algorithm within Linux. So the dots here are the median uh, throughputs and delays. And the ellipse is the one sigma variance of the throughput and the delay about the mean. 
So that's where TCP cubic lies. For comparison, we also plot cubic combined with SFQ card. Mm -hmm. So this is cubic running at the endpoints along with the SFQ card algorithm, which is a combination of stochastic fair queuing, um, which basically does fair queuing across all, all, all queues, and uh, the cardinal queue management algorithm, which tries to keep queue lengths small by dropping. So as expected, we see that cubic over SFQ cardinal has lesser queuing delay, but both both these uh, algorithms have significantly lesser throughput than the Remy CC. So this is all well and good, but remember that in this scenario, we <coughs> tested on the same network that we trained on. So it's good that it, it comes close to the ideal, but uh, I mean, in, in practice, we have a mismatch between the training and the testing networks. So there's two kinds of issues that happen in practice. So let's let's look at the simplest of them. So first, what if instead of a single network in the set of training networks, you have a range of networks. So you have a training range, and you have uncertainty as to where in that range the real network actually lies. Um, and second, the training range that you actually train for might be different from the range of networks on which you actually test, right? So is there a trade-off between the range over which you train and the breadth of the range over which you can test the protocol? And an associated question is simply by broadening the training range, do you lose performance across the entire training range, even if you confine yourself to testing on, on the training range itself? So we look at both of these uh, problems in the context of link rates. So we keep every other parameter fixed. We vary the link rate alone from 1 to 1,000 megabits per second. And on the y-axis, we plot the normalized objective function. Uh, so the objective function is some uh, log of throughput over delay. And we normalize this relative to what an ideal protocol would achieve. So just by the way, we normalize the ideal protocol is at 0. I mean, that's to make sure we have a common baseline. Then we design or MECC for a narrow 2x training range of link rates, which is the geometric mean of this, of this range. So we see that because we've restricted ourselves to a very narrow range of link rates, uh, the generality is pretty bad. Like out, just outside the 2x range, it falls off fairly drastically. Now, if we widen this 2x to a 10x range, um, we see that the performance is good over the entire 10x range but again falls off very sharply outside that range. So the interesting thing to note here is over the narrower 2x range, the 10x optimized Remy CC is not too much worse than the Remy CC that's optimized for the narrower 2x range. And we went ahead and optimized a 100x range and a 1000x range Remy CC. And in all of these cases, these protocols are pretty close to the ideal and furthermore, uh, they are as good as more specific protocols that are optimized for narrower ranges. So just to round this up, this is what the human design protocols today look like. So cubic over SFQ cardinal um, is unilaterally worse than the 1000x range Remy CC over the entire range. And the other thing to note here is that the performance actually tails off as the link rate increases. Now, I'm not sure if this was intentional, but this definitely seems to happen. Uh, this happens both with cubic and with cubic or SFQ card. The point here is not to like blame the designer for getting it wrong. The point here is there are going to be this, these inadvertent assumptions in any protocol. So it's good to sort of codify what those assumptions are going to be at design time itself. Uh, rather than discover that this goes wrong at runtime. Um, but the two main takeaways from the graph. So there's a clear generality of this training range trade-off. So if you define generality as whether it will work on an arbitrary testing range, which is different from the training range, uh, that doesn't seem to happen. Like if you train for a narrow 2x range, it just doesn't work outside that range. But in practice, that really doesn't matter because we see that there's very weak evidence of a perform, performance versus training range trade-off. In other words, by broadening the training range, you don't lose all that much. 
So if you don't know exactly what link rate you're going to be working with, it's not such a bad idea to design for an extremely wide range of link rates, and you don't give up too much performance as a result. Yeah. Why is it you only prepared against two and not the other players? In in this particular experiment. Sure. Uh, I mean, we compared with a few other flavors of TCP as well. Broadly, the conclusions are similar okay. because they're all they all fill uh, buffers and rely on drops. I mean, compound TCP does rely on delay as well, but we we broadly seen similar results with the other TCP variants as well. Um, so. This is kind of interesting from, from, the, from the perspective of designing a protocol because it suggests that we can design a forwards compatible protocol that not just that doesn't just work on link rates today, but also potentially on link rates in the future, um, which is at odds with the way there are variants like fast TCP and high speed TCP that are designed for like high speed links and so on. So our findings here suggest that it might be possible to design one protocol that works across a fairly wide range in link rates. So you're probably looking at this and wondering, okay, the link rate remains fixed over the duration of the experiment, or the simulation in this case, and it's one of the easier things to train for. And the harder thing is probably the number of senders, because if you have like 100 senders, you can, and, and each of them is on or off with a probability half, then you can have a fairly, fairly wide distribution of the number of senders that are on at any point in time. So maybe the question that's harder is, can we learn a protocol that performs well both when there are few senders using the protocol for their transmissions and there are very many senders using the same protocol for their transmissions? There are a bunch of other things that you might want to design for as well, like you know, like loss and uh, things that you can't necessarily control, like loss and congestion. And yeah, you're like absolutely people. right. Uh, there's quite a few things that we could yeah, they came to the assumptions. Those are things that lots of people have to consider in the real world as well, and probably have. And so, so but this is interesting as well. We, we really look at this as sort of the first step yeah. towards those questions. I have a few slides at the end as to how we're sort of applying similar ideas to more practical real world issues. Uh, we haven't specifically considered, considered loss as yeah, such. Loss, delay, uh, yeah, but yeah. I mean, maybe that, that'll answer your question. Um, so yeah, can we learn a protocol that performs well both with few senders and with very many senders using the same protocol? So in this experiment, we sweep the number of senders from one through hundred, and again we plot the normalized objective function on the y-axis. Um, so the ideal protocol is at zero. Um, now let's say we optimize the protocol with the knowledge that there's exactly one or two senders. I mean, no one in practice would run such a protocol, but as a thought experiment, let's assume we optimized for this extremely narrow range, one or two senders. So when we run this protocol over the entire range, what we see is that it's great over that very narrow range, but it falls off very drastically outside. So let's extend this range. Now let's say we had between one and 10 senders. Now, it's slightly worse than the one to two sender that we see over the narrower range, but overall, it's pretty good until about 10 senders. So then again, falls off drastically after that. So let's say we optimize for between one and 50 senders. Now, this is good over a fairly wide range, but starts falling off when the number of senders is small. right? And a more extreme example of this is if you are optimized for between one and 100 senders, so it's great once the number of senders is beyond 40 or so, it falls off sharply below that. Now, let's get rid of some of these graphs and just look at these two for a moment. So if you have between one and 10 senders, you can do well when the number of senders is actually small. So if you train a protocol for between one and 10 senders, you can do well when the number of senders is small, but it falls off pretty badly after that. The other end, when you have between one and 100 senders or when you train for a for between one and hundred senders, it's great when the number of senders is somewhat large, but it falls off when the number of senders is small. So it, it does seem like that there's some kind of trade-off between doing well when there are few senders, which necessitates 
an ability to grab spare bandwidth quickly because senders might leave and you want to grab available capacity quickly. And but grabbing available capacity too quickly when there are very many senders can lead to either increased queuing delays if your queues are large or they can lead to several packets being dropped and retransmissions which are bad too, which again hurts performance when the same protocol optimized for a small number of senders is run on a large number of senders. Could you remind us what your normalized, what your objective function is again? Yeah, so the objective function is the sum over all senders of the log of throughput over delay. And we do that for the ideal protocol, and we do that for any protocol, and we subtract that. So, yeah. And you're still testing in the same uh, basically setup that you train your algorithm, right? No, we have a separate synthesis by simulation approach within the Remy simulator, which is different from NS2. So, is this about the same if you consider, like, you said flow completion time was another, average flow completion time was another metric you could use? Yeah, I wonder if the same thing, how sensitive do you think it is to the objective function? Right. So all of these results in, in, in that, I, that I'm presenting here are based on the sum log throughput over delay uh -huh. objective function. Uh, we did do some work. I mean, I spent the summer at Google where we were looking at tail flow completion time and things like that. Yeah. Uh, we started off with a slightly different learning algorithm. In other words, we started off with a slightly different structure of the protocol. Um, knowing some things that we already know work well in a data center context like ECN. Uh, we were able to optimize it uh, to better than the status quo in some sense, but we don't have comparable results for these experiments as such. But we have looked at those other objective functions, but not in the context of these specific experiments. So um, just to round this up, when you when you train a protocol for so I, I would be interested if you if you dispensed with delay or dispensed with throughput. Clearly they they are somehow related through queuing delay, but if you if you were to repeat exactly the same thing with just throughput and compare again with an objective function of one over delay, I think that you. It would be really interesting to know I mean, your, your intuition that this that the difference was related to the ability to grab bandwidth it would allow you to explore whether that's actually the case, right? Whether that's the reason. So basically, objective functions that either focus exclusively on throughput or on yeah. delay. Yeah, yeah. Not that that's a good objective function necessarily, but at least will give you intuition. As to what sure. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely something. So yeah, the, I, I think. Something I've noticed with this work in general, and, and I'm going to ask the sort of obvious question, like, sure, you guys are training something, so you don't know exactly how, why it decides what it decides in sure. the end, but I'm curious what ended up being different between these two. Like, what parameters had outputted were different between the 100 sender learned algorithm and the 10 sender learned algorithm? So in this specific case, we we don't know at the microscopic level what, how, how the structure of the two protocols differed. Okay. Um, why? I'm just curious. Yeah. Why did they differ? Why did you not know? Because, like something very interesting to know, right? Yeah. Because partially, I don't think we've gotten a handle yet on how to analyze protocols with about a hundred different rules, where you have like these. It's it's not like analyzing TCP, which has you know, an algorithm that can be stated in about five or six lines. Mm -hmm. We can sort of state the algorithm in five or six lines here, but it involves looking up the current state in a lookup table, which then ma maps it to the action. And those lookup tables are extremely complicated. They're about a uh, hundred rules, which means um, to give you a sense of what that means. So if you have a, say you're maintaining some state, like the received, uh, like, like a moving average over the rate of, of packs being received or uh, packets being sent. And based on that, the specific value of that state, um, we have a range-based lookup table that could have as many as uh, 100 different subdivisions. And because we have this very you know, threshold-like behavior, we haven't yet found a good way to analyze these protocols and understand why, at the microscopic level, they perform well. Uh, it's definitely something we're interested in uh, to try and see if uh, tools from the standard 
TCP analysis literature, like control loops and stability uh, and point carrier maps and things like that apply in this context. It's just that the rule tables are complicated enough that it's, we don't have a clean way of understanding exactly what those rules, why those rules do what they do. So you may not understand exactly like, but you can observe the behavior of the protocol and you can say, look, like this is more aggressive in doing X, Y, and Z. This is a little more passive, something like that, right? Can you observe the output of the protocol in terms of running it and actually seeing the way it behaves and seeing the differences in it? Well, that's exactly what we're doing here. We're observing sense, the honest. output of the protocol here. Uh, I guess that's kind of what Nick was suggesting. If you pick another metric and then maybe observe that metric and run these. No, but, but point taken, both what Nick said and what you're saying, like I don't think we have a clean handle on how, how we're go, going to go about analyzing or debugging these protocols at the microscopic level. So, yeah. You went for, uh, you said you had like a uh, hundred uh, range entries in the table, right? so suppose you had one protocol that's a hundred ranges, and you took the same protocol, but you only had ten ranges, and then and you run and this test, you know, just ten. I mean, if, if it turns out that the hundred range entry that ended up with falls into the ten range entry that ended up in this protocol, you might start to So, if I understand your question right, you're saying if we were able to get similar performance with a simpler protocol, you get the same bucket. I mean, if you get the same quantized bucket in a simpler table, you might develop more intuition. But it doesn't right. have to be a hundred thing table. So what you're suggesting is doing it at the at the microscopic level. Basically, every time the protocol runs, whether it falls into the same bucket as. Yeah, so we've seen what happens at the level of the final output. And no, no, no. In terms of this bucket, absolutely. Yeah, we haven't done it at the level of per, per packet, ex whether they're in lockstep or not, which is, I think, what you're suggesting. Like, run something with 10 and run something with 100 and see if they're in lockstep. Uh, we can definitely do that. The issue is if they're not in lockstep, as will be the case, it's, it's kind of hard to figure out why they diverge because they have these extremely. Yeah, in that case, it's not interesting. It's not an interesting protocol in that case because there's no like intuition. Well, I mean, there's multiple ways to look at that. Uh, one, they they do give better performance at the microscopic level, and two, when your compiler outputs assembly code, you don't know exactly what the compiler is doing there either, and you cannot go and look at the assembly code and directly figure out what part of your source code it translated to. I think that's. Are you sure? <laughs> I mean, I mean, decompilers do, right? I mean, it works. works I mean, well if, if, you, if you turn on O3 and like yeah, it does it's, its own. It's not a good comparison because yeah. compilers are made. The rules are made by humans. Yeah. So the sort of outputs you can kind of figure out deterministically what happens. There. The rules are made by humans. The rules of optimization. We should, yeah, we should take this. Yeah. 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 Uh, but no. Point taken in general, we don't have a clean handle on. Analyzing these uh, and, rules. I mean, one thing that, that might make it clear is if you could sort of explain sort of the model, your sort of designs, protocol design space, and sort of what are the vectors in that space and how you chose them and how big they are. That, which, that's I guess might shed a little bit of light on that. I don't know if you. Um, I mean, I can take the offline. I, uh, I have a few slides on that. I can take the offline. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So the scenario here, when you say there's n senders, it's uh, n long lived. Those? Yeah. Uh, well, this this particular scenario is n senders uh, each with a fifty percent duty cycle. Each with a fifty percent duty cycle. Oh, I see. So yeah. we have a like random on off. Yeah. So um, what we see here is Risa does well when there are few senders or when there are very many senders, but this doesn't seem to be particularly unique to to these protocols because if you look at Cubic. Or cubic or SFQ cardinal, they seem to again pick some kind of trade off between doing well at lower degrees of multiplexing and higher degrees of multiplexing. So, in cubic's case, its performance tails off as the number of senders is too small. So, what, what we see here, at least within the scope of our learning tool, is that there seems to be a trade off between performance with few and many senders. Um, and again, this is slightly at odds with. Uh, with the way protocols are designed today, where you you 
sometimes design protocols for high delay links or to, uh, high speed links are extremely low delay links, but you rarely design protocols for a specific degree of multiplexing, partially because you don't know the number of senders. But it seems like there is value to that kind of approach, uh, especially if you're able to tightly bound the, the degree of multiplexing in the network. So, um, so I've talked about link rate and the number of senders. Um, the next question that we look at is, can we learn a protocol with, with a mismatched set of assumptions about the number of bottlenecks? So specifically, the question we're trying to look at is, let's say you train on a one bottleneck topology, two flows, a single, single dumbbell link, um, each, of when, each of which is on and off with, uh, with an average duration of one second. But we then test it on this two bottleneck topology, which is a, a, a three node uh, topology. If the first flow goes from A to C, the second one from A to B, and the third one from B to C. So really simple experiment, but the goal here is to see if you can train a protocol for this topology and have it perform well on this as well. So um, here we plot the throughput of the longer flow, the one from A to C, and we test this on a two bottleneck topology, and all these results are from the two bottleneck topology. We don't show the other two uh, flows because their throughputs were roughly comparable across all these protocols. We sweep the speed of the slower link from 10 through 100 megabits per second. And again, on the y axis, we plot what the ideal protocol would get. And relative to this, uh, we see that a full two bottleneck. Remy CC, which is a Remy CC trained for this entire topology. Like it knows at design time that that's the topology it's going to be running on. So that's only about 17% off in throughput from, from an ideal protocol. Uh, but perhaps the more interesting thing is that a simplified one bottleneck Remy CC is not that much worse. Um, and at least from this experiment, it seems like for this very restricted case of simplifying from two bottlenecks to one, uh, we're able to actually get pretty good performance with a simplified number, a simplified assumption on the number of bottles. And just for comparison, cubic over SFQ cardinal falls somewhere here, uh, which has much less of throughput than all the other protocols. So uh, the conclusion here, and we're not saying this holds for arbitrarily large topologies. It'll be interesting to see how, how this extends. But at least simplifying from a two bottleneck network to a single bottleneck network only modestly hurts performance. So, so far, all of these experiments have dealt with homogeneous scenarios where all protocols. Yeah. How do you know if you had enough training data? Like, if you had more training data, could it do better? You mean, yeah, this could be closer to that. Like, all, these lines could be closer if we had more training data. That's definitely a possibility. But it doesn't. How do you know that you have enough? Oh, all I'm saying is it it will only strengthen this conclusion if you have more training data and, and if it improves the protocols that are generated. Yeah, but I was just wondering how did you decide that you had enough training data? Did ah. you see how well it did and then stop? Yeah, so the way the tool, uh, the protocol generation tool works is we sort of let it synthesize an algorithm and it keeps spitting out what the current value of the objective function is. And after a point in time, it just tapers off. Um, sometimes it regresses. And yeah, we could have been stuck in a local minimum or a local maximum, as the case may be. Uh, it's entirely possible. Uh, but at that point, we sort of decide this is the best that this tool can do. And those are the condition control algorithms that we then evaluate. And when you test on it, do you, do you use the same work like the traffic arrival thing or is it still like random yeah so this is um, the workload and the topology that we use when training and this is the workload and the topology that we use when testing so it's like the on or off thing is yeah. is it random and both yeah or is it so this is uh when it's on it's on for a random duration drawn from an exponential distribution with mean one second, and when it's off, it's again. And when you're testing it, it's again, you draw exactly, or you test on the same? Oh, we, we, yeah, these are independent seeds, if that's yeah. your question. Yeah, yeah, these are independent seeds, and like this, there's two random processes here, there are three here, and they're all independent, like because there are three flows here. So you're not 
Well, the the stochastic process that dictates the flow arrivals and the flow sizes are the same, but the random seeds are going to be different because we sample it independently when training and when testing. Do you, do you have multiple training runs to make sure that you're in not not in some particular sort of strange outlier or ah uh, or multiple I guess training and testing runs? I guess that's the one problem with stochastic methods versus deterministic. Well, both of them have problems, really. So what we do is we run the training each of the individual training runs for long enough. And then we average them over uh, multiple link rates. Uh, so we sweep the link rates from 10 to 100 megabits per second. Uh, and yeah, when we test, yeah, we, we run it multiple times with different iterations and so on. Um, yeah. Okay. Do you have SFQ Kyle running on both of those queues in, in the second test or just for the first one? Yeah, they're running on both queues. Yeah. That plot, the next one, is really cool because it shows that, like, at around 20, they diverge. That's where, so like whatever behavior is going on when the throughput is less than 20 megabits per second, they're doing something similar with these two different learned protocols, right? Or at least like the output is similar in some sense, which is kind of cool. I'm wondering like what it is, is what is it about 20 megabits per second that caused them to start diverging, you know, and above? It's just weird. Well, to be honest, we haven't looked at that particular question because it could be 20 here. I mean, it could be a little bit more if we let this run a little longer. I mean, it didn't seem like there was anything sacrosanct to whether it was. It's just a clear point diving. where one sort of is shooting up and the other is saying this. I don't know. I'm just I mean, no, we, we haven't looked at that uh, at that level of detail, but specifically because it seems like that point would be slightly different. I mean, it's not going to go like some, somewhere completely here, but the, the exact n nature of where this deflection happens would be different from so I'll say that whenever I see this in one of my graphs where there's some point where like thing behavior just changes, I when you start digging down, you'll find, oh yeah, sure. Like because of this one parameter, the frame size, whatever, there's just something that makes 20 megabits per second the hot number that things start happening. It'd be interesting to find out like why that 20 megabit per second. Sure. Here. So th does the uh, distribution of the links, you have some slow links and fast links, does this matter at all? Or I don't think also the topology would matter, right? Uh, well, the distribution of the links, I mean, yeah, we sample the link rate randomly from between 10 and, I mean, actually, this is a complete sweep, so we sort of try every possible value of both links. But we, basically look at every possible value of link one and every possible value of link two. And really what we plot here is the span. So this is the speed of the slower link and this is what happens when the faster link varies from the slower link all the way to the um, maximum link speed. So we've sort of looked at all possible combinations of link speeds on the two bottleneck topology. Both link speeds are sampled uh, At the time at which we train, uh, we sort of, we sample them deterministically over the job, like, but geometrically spaced here. I'm but when just we curious that does it mean that when we like if I pick a random sample in the second case and the slow link is really slow, it's really effectively a single bottleneck. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If you picked if you picked a sample where this was like say 100 megabits per second, and this uh, sorry, this was like say. One megabit per second, and this was hundred megabit per second. It's so effectively. Doesn't that explain the? I mean, that graph always at the lower end. You expect those two to line up. I mean, you're, you're running on a single bottleneck network on when the speed of the slower link is like ten. Perfect. Sorry, this is the speed of the slower link, but the span sort of looks at the speed of the faster link. So it goes from ten all the way to hundred megabits no, per no, second. I know. I'm just trying to explain why on the. the on the left hand side, you expect to see those to converge because those scenarios, if I understand how this plot is how this plot is generated, those scenarios really correspond to a network where there were two links, but there was really one bottleneck. So the thing that you trained on the single bottleneck, it's not going to see the different. Hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, look, 
that's that likely what's going on here. So, um, I guess were there any other questions? Yeah, sure. So with cubic programs, as you got all, you're saying the speed of only gets 20 megabits per second. The proof that you get is only two and a half megabits per second. Uh, on the longer link. This is when the speed of the slower link is 20 and the faster link varies from 20 all the way to 100. Then you get only, yeah, 2 megabits per second. How do you pick buffer sizes? So in this case, all, all the buffer sizes were 5 times the bandwidth delay product. We just kept them constant throughout the experiment. Uh, you're right that cubic would probably have slightly better performance if we reduce the buffer size. with respect to whatever the actual link speeds are? Uh, for level? each of these, so it's uh, so it's five times the bandwidth times the round trip here, and five times the bandwidth times the round trip here. So you have some packet loss eventually, or? Uh, we have packet loss on the tail of the queue. There's no stochastic loss. Oh, that, that can influence, that can impact your results at some point. So. Sure, yeah, it probably does. It definitely Im impacts the results for cubic or SFQ cardinal. Uh, in our case, we try and keep the he was small to begin with, so we're not that influenced by packet loss. Small is five times the DDP. Wait, but that's a few times we're going to drop packets long before the buffer fills up. Yeah. Sure, I mean, yeah, yeah. but the point is, we keep the buffer size is five times the bandwidth delay product. We keep the queues much lower than that by, you know, appropriately paying. I mean, sometimes it's better if you, I mean, ships are taken back to a very large buffer. I mean, that's always a better comparison. And then kiss on a blind. So SFQ is a particular buffer management algorithm. It decides when to drop a packet. So I don't think the buffer size matters very much when you have this Kyle algorithm on there. So when you're running with Cardinal, yes, it doesn't yeah. matter. When you're running just with Cubic, there will be tail drop from the back of the five bandwidth delay product buffer. But Cardinal is going to have a target delay. Mm -hmm. um, if your buffer is small, let's say like your, your wind speed is really small, and the actual buffer that you um, see if your link speed is small, the target delay of Caudal can only be achieved with uh, actually I guess it's the other. If the link speed is high, the target delay can only be achieved with a large queue. Does the buffer size so they always permit that? Or would it be out of range? Like Caudal is trying to tune for a buffer occupancy that is impossible. That. There could be interactions between the tail drop buffer and Cardel. For all these experiments, we just use Cardel in the default configuration because that's the envisaged deployment but, but, mode. So my, my, my point is that the Cardel target delay parameter um, inevitably makes an assumption about buffer size. Right? I'm, I'm missing something. Does it? Um, it has to. We have experienced issues with that algorithm. When the preferred delay is smaller than the amount of MTU at the bandwidth, so if you're running at two megabits, or say say a megabit, it takes 13 milliseconds to get a, a packet through the interface. So um, it's best to re reset the cuddle target to 13 or 15 milliseconds in that particular case in the current version of the algorithm. But they're running at 10 plus throughout here. What I'm thinking is that they have a, a great deal of over buffering in the overall. Uh, Remy CC model where they are not dropping packets and they are experiencing latency um, in order to achieve that. No, I don't think that's the case. The buffer is set at five times the bandwidth delay product, but that doesn't mean the queue occupancy actually reaches that because the whole point when you optimize for a long throughput over delay is to keep the per packet delays small as well. Okay. But point taken, we could probably run it with the more updated version of SFQ Cardel, uh, but and we could see what things change. Seeing the raw data. Go ahead. <laughs> um, okay, so let's now look at the heterogeneous setting where uh, we have a case where you might have a new protocol that we're trying to develop and an legacy and a legacy implementation that you want to share fairly with. So specifically, we try and develop two Remy CCs, uh, one that's TCP aware, which contends with another TCP aware Remy CC half the time, and uh, TCP new Reno, which is a legacy protocol half the time. And we also 
learn a TCP naive Remy CC that contends with only a TCP naive Remy CC all the time. So this is sort of designed with the assumption that you don't have an incumbent um, protocol, and this is uh, that you do have an incumbent protocol, and this one is designed with the assumption that the only thing that you're running on the network is a TCP naive Remy CC. So uh, let's see what happens when they're running in, in a homogeneous scenario all by themselves. So this is a 10 megabit per second link roughly. Um, so 10 megabit per second link and the throughput of with two senders. And we see that new Reno roughly achieves a 5 megabit per second fair share throughput allocation. And so does the TCP <coughs> Remy CC. But when we run the TCP aware Remy CC, uh, it again re reaches the same throughput allocation, but it has an increased queuing delay. So baking in this TCP awareness seems to hurt the queuing delay. But in the heterogeneous setting, when the Remy CC competes against TCP Neurino, the TCP naive Remy CC gets squeezed out by Neurino. So Neurino gets slightly more than its fair share. Makes sense. It fills the buffer while, while the TCP naive Remy CC can do nothing about it because it wasn't trained with that assumption in mind. But when we run Neurino alongside the TCP aware Remy CC, that both are closer to their fair share, the queuing delay also reduces. So this really tells us that TCP awareness uh, benefits you when needed. So in the heterogeneous scenario, being TCP aware helps you compete more fairly with uh, an existing sender. But there is a cost because you become too aggressive in the process and you have increased queuing delay and running all by yourself. Um, so there's some obvious caveats to this. Um, we're using Remy as a proxy for an optimal learner, right? Which is a big caveat. And uh, yeah, we recognize that. And Sure, the results could change if we have better learners in the future. Um, and this was one learner that we had at that point. So we ran the experiments with, with, with Remy as the learner. But somewhat practically, if some of the negative results don't hold, like for instance, you probably are able to develop a protocol that spans a wide range of multiplexing, that's actually a good thing. So those, those are the caveats to this, the, to this line of work. Um, and we think this is slightly more broadly applicable uh, to other things outside of the simulation environment in which we've, we've done this so far. So I'll just briefly describe three ongoing projects that we're working on. So one, um, my colleague uh, Pratik Shatakar, myself, and Keith, we're working on this uh, notion of protocols for wide area networks where you, you could have objectives which are different depending on what application is using the protocol. You could have things like file transfer times, which are appropriate for Dropbox or Google Drive, page load times for a browser, and stall free video. Now, in the same ethos of learnability, it's worth asking whether if you really cared about getting the best performance for any of these three things, you need to optimize for each separately, or can you just have one protocol that works for all, all, all these objectives it, pretty reasonably? So the question is, do you need to make assumptions about what objective the protocol is optimizing for? Then there were questions about flow completion time here. Uh, so this is some work that I did over the summer at Google, um, where within the data center, the objective is to minimize the tail flow completion time for short flows while making sure the long flows don't suffer too much in the median. Um, and there's evidence that the workload varies quite a bit from one cluster to the other and also varies temporarily depending on time of day. And we don't have any answer to this, but it's worth asking at an intellectual level whether we need to optimize for each workload separately. Uh, in other words, uh, do, you, do you gain too much by localizing your algorithm to each cluster, or does just one algorithm work really well or reasonably well across the entire cluster? We feel like this framework sort of allows you to try and answer these questions progressively more rigorously as the learners get better. And it seemed only appropriate to mention SDN here at Stanford. So we did some work about a year ago where we sort of showed that no single in-network scheme is best for all for different uh, application objectives. So if you want high throughput, you probably just don't want to have drop packets. But if you want low delay, you probably want to use something like Cardinal. And this was our way of sort of making the case for more programmable data planes. Um, there's been a lot of work from Stanford in this regard. The tiny packet programs work and the reconfigurable match action tables that allow switches to do much more than they can today uh, and go as far as implementing things like the rate control protocol, on, which, which requires support from the switch. 
So it's worth asking whether any of these conclusions change once you have switch support. Like, do we have to like redo these experiments completely, or or what's the case when you have when you can not only design the end-to-end -end protocol, but also design the component that runs in the network together to optimize for some objective. Um, anyway, in summary, uh, here's what we know so far. We can tolerate some mismatch and link rate assumptions. Uh, we need to be precise about the number of senders. Um, within the scope of our experiment between two and one bottleneck, we can to tolerate some mismatch in the number of bottlenecks. And TCP mm -hmm. compatibility is really a double-edged sword. There's the benefit which you get, which is playing fairly with TCP when you run in a heterogeneous setting. But there's also the real cost of increased queuing delay if you were running all by yourself. So all the figures in this paper are reproducible. Uh, you can go here to look at instructions to reproduce this as well. Uh, thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. So you start off the talk with an interesting premise, which is that um, in wireless networks, there's almost no loss, and yet TCP so TCP isn't really designed for operating on them because TCP assumes you get feedback through loss, I guess. But what's funny is wireless networks, I believe, as far as I understand, were designed to not have loss because loss hurt TCP. <laughs> and so they were like, so the question is, if we're in a world where now the, out, now the protocols are learning on their own, what happens to our lower layer protocols? If you're an LTE designer, are you going to say, like, how do we optimize for these protocols running on top of us now? It's going to be interesting. So that's a great question. The way we have viewed this really is the transport layer being at the service of the application layer while respecting the constraints of the link layer. You could sort of turn the problem around and say, if the transport layer was fixed, what's the best that you should be doing at the link layer? Uh, we haven't looked at that ourselves, but you could change what knobs you have and, and what are your constraints. You could also do sort of a co-design where you try to sort of you know make a make uh, sort of you know, good link and transport protocols that play well together across their uh, yeah, love cross the their optimization. Lock the level two guys and the level three guys. So I mean, <laughs> core design is sort of what I had in mind when we we're talking about jointly developing both the end-to-end -end scheme and the in-network scheme. To serve as some objective, uh, but you could extend that all the way further to jointly designing the transport protocol and the link layer. We have no no idea how that's doable or whether it's doable, but that's definitely it. Maybe interesting to see you do automated stuff with the link layer. I mean, I don't know. It would be crazy. There's also this, this kind of interesting possibility that if you're that maybe your learning could take place dynamically based on sort of application patterns and application constraints. You know, and also this also this really neat idea. I think you know, other people have pro proposed as well, which is is suggested by your graphs, which is, you know, always pick the best protocol for whatever range you're in. You know, so you could have multiple protocols. Like, well, okay, I know that I know that if I just have one sender, then this protocol is no good. So I should just use the one that, oh, send everything as long as you have buffer space or something. You know, the sort of naive design. You know, or oh, do I have to interact with TCP? Oh, that doesn't look like it. So I can just use the the TCP, you know, intolerant version, things like that. So I, I see two separate threads there. The okay. first one that you mentioned was sort of dynamically learning yeah, as dynamic you put learning, in your new right. network. So uh, maybe they could you know, start with a set, but then yeah. dynamically improve. So there's work from UAUC that explores exactly that possibility. They call it performance-oriented condition control. It's on archive. I encourage you to check it out. But they basically have the same notion of an objective function, but they do hill climbing at runtime. Um, so as for the other question that you had, where you sort of have separate protocols for each range of link rates, um, it's definitely something we've thought about, but there are issues then of first sensing which range you're in and then applying the right protocol. And if different senders get it wrong, you could have other interactions that we don't know, like what their global behavior would look like. Because you've now broken up the problem into sensing whether you're in the right range and then applying the right protocol there. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely worth investigating further. Oh, so, as mentioned, you have precession of a path network of center. So, how did your token know that precession is correct or is wrong? So, we sort of assume these are inputs to the protocol design process. So, the designer needs some knowledge of 
what the workload will look like, what the topology will look like, and we're sort of showing what happens when the designer is wrong about it. The protocol is just synthesized respecting those inputs. The protocol at runtime probably implicitly figures those things out, but the way we see the workflow going is the designer supplies these inputs as to how many senders are there. And the designer could be right or wrong or somewhat right about it. So that means uh, uh, if the nice work is uh, uh, perfect and trend, yeah, before it's a 10 center, later it's a 100 center, we will continue to compatible for this change. Right? Because you, when you run your protocol, you should have a precise about the center, you precise is 10, but later that's 100. Then the interior protocol don't know that's change. So right. So, no mechanism to handle this issue. So what you're saying is it's kind of running right now in a state where there are 100 senders, but suddenly the number of senders becomes 200. And like, how does it react? We don't know how it will behave. I mean, it might not work. And like, in fact, we sort of see that like when you have 100 senders and we suddenly run it, you know, two days later on a network with two senders, it, it doesn't work. As all the sender assumption that you use a TCP protocol. So this is, we think of this as a drop and replacement for TCP congestion control, yeah. So, but in the real network, that's maybe multiple protocol. Some is no congestion control, that's it. And indeed, they may detect as congestion, but they use a TCP congestion. So later, they continue to serve. So, the real, I mean, the case where we have heterogeneous senders, where different senders have different protocols, is what we look at in the TCP compatibility experiments. Uh, I mean, there's other things we could do where, where we can look at senders that have absolutely no congestion control existing with um, such computer generated protocols as well. Oh, I, what I meant by that was you can, you do have benefits of TCP compatibility. Right, which is you can coexist well um, with TCP when you train yourself with the knowledge that there is going to be a TCP in the network or TCP new Reno in the network. But you also lose performance in the process when you run alone. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah last so, question. Uh, uh, in that graph where you had 10, 10 senders and 100 senders, and there are two different yeah. uh, protocols that you, know, that you learned. Right. What is different? Is it, is, are you learning the structure of protocols or are you learning parameters that should be used for uh, same structure? Or equivalently, is there like a big graph and those are two subgraphs or a big graph or are there just two completely different graphs? Every day? So, I mean, I could walk you through the learning procedure pretty quickly. So, the way we look at the protocol is it's a range based root table from the current state that each center maintains to the action. So the state that we track, uh, things like uh, moving average of the packet transmit times and a moving average over the interarrival times, uh, things like this. So we picked these four because we tried a bunch of other things. They didn't work. We tried removing one of these. It got worse. Like, you know, there could be other sets of features that work better for other scenarios. But we still designed the states. Some human designed the numbers. Yeah, yeah. so th th there is some human involvement in the process. Yeah, it's not completely automated yet. I mean, we wish it could be that automated. But yeah, there is some human guiding parts of the protocol design process by specifying the state. We also specify the action, which is modify the window with some kind of facing. And then we start with one rule table, which is just one action regardless of state. So you just do something blindly regardless of actually observing the network. Then we just keep optimizing that action by subdividing that rule table. So I mean, we have a mock-up here of how that happens. So we keep running it and then optimizing the regions of the network that receive the most use at runtime. So and back the, the ranges are also human designed or those are learned? The ranges are learned at runtime. We specify this thing like the minimum and the maximum to some extremely large values, but the splits are learned at runtime by the learning algorithm. Yeah. Let's continue with it again. Yeah. <laughs>